This is Professor Taylor's lecture on parts four and five of chapter 13 in our text for civil procedure, um, covering heightened pleading and the modern plausibility standard of pleading. This lecture should be um, viewed uh, and studied in conjunction with those parts of the text um, after studying the basic pleadings um, video that was uh, circulated previously. So um, we're going to begin this video with a brief discussion of heightened pleading as provided for under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, as that provides a good sort of background contrast to the notice pleading standard um, that we've been examining and sets up the framework for the modern plausibility pleading standard that we'll be then spending um, some more substantial time on. So the idea of heightened pleading is that uh, by, in, in contrast with notice pleading, um, which requires only that enough information to put the defendant and other parties on notice of what the claims are, that in some circumstances, um, something more than that should be required. And we have a source of law that provides um, for that requirement specifically, and that is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 9B, which says that in alleging fraud or mistake, a party must state with particularity the circumstances constituting fraud or mistake. So this is by contrast then to Rule 8, which we've been studying, um, which says that a uh, to state a claim for relief, a plaintiff need only um, uh, state that, um, you know, a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. And as Rule 9b makes clear, this heightened pleading standard applies only to fraud or mistake. So one might question, well, why is that? And I think the text um, sort of attempts to address that question as much as is possible. And it seems just to be a matter of um, you know, line drawing by the rule drafters that in claims of fraud and mistake, there are some policy reasons that maybe something more should be required, required in order to get um, uh, into court. Um, and that uh, those circumstances are somehow just slightly or enough different from other types of claims to be um, uh, subjected to this heightened requirement. Um, over the years, uh, courts have periodically imposed what uh, might be termed heightened pleading standards, but the U.S. Supreme Court, upon review, has um, almost wholesale rejected any other heightened pleading standard that has been proposed. Um, you have an example in your text, the Leatherman versus Tarrant County Narcotics case, which um, considered what a heightened pleading standard that had been adopted by the Fifth Circuit uh, as applicable in cases alleging um, uh, civil rights violations uh, against uh, municipalities and in particular the um, uh, immunity um, standards uh, in conjunction with the uh, respondeat superior liability of the um, uh, municipalities. And uh, the court in that case held that there was no such thing as any heightened pleading standard other than what is provided for in Rule 9b. And as the court in that case explains, um, expressio unius est exclusio alterius, and please don't fault me for my poor Latin pronunciation, but um, that the court squarely placed its rationale on the provision in the rules for heightened pleading in Rule 9b and its limits uh, to only claims of fraud or mistake so that any other type of claim not included in Rule 9b should therefore not be subjected to heightened pleading. If it's not included in 9b, which does expressly provide for heightened pleading, then it is not subject to a heightened pleading standard. Um, so with that background in place then, we need to move into our discussion of the key to mo understanding the modern pleading requirements. And we refer to this as the plausibility pleading. And this began to evolve with the Supreme Court's decision in Bell Atlantic Court versus Twombly in 2007. And, and as a sort of background threshold matter, I want you to recognize that Rule 8 remains the governing federal rule of civil procedure concerning what a pleading must include. And that is that it need only include a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. 
The question is, what does that mean? And um, as we've talked about in the last video, the um, Supreme Court in Conley versus Gibson had um, held that uh, Rule 8 then essentially requires that as long as a plaintiff has pled enough um, so that uh, there is some basis for relief, in other words, um, that there, it must appear that there is no set of facts on which the plaintiff would be entitled to relief um, in order for the claim to be subject to dismissal. And um, uh, that Conley standard had proliferated in the years after it was decided up until Bell Atlantic versus Twombly, which first began to cast some doubt on it. So um, let's talk first about what the decision and uh, case in Bell Atlantic was about, and then that'll form our foundation for the big case, um, principal case in your text, Ashcroft versus Iqbal. So in the Bell Atlantic case, the plaintiffs were class, it was a class action type suit, and they sued the Baby Bells, all the Bell corporations who provided telephone and internet services, for violation of antitrust laws. In other words, they contended that all these phone companies were in illegal cahoots in setting their prices for phone and internet services. Most of you have paid for phone and internet services um, as uh, budding adults or real full-fledged adults, whichever may be the case for you. And um, uh, so, so the idea was the antitrust laws um, would prohibit those companies from getting together and setting their prices in such a way as to um, be able to raise them as a group so that um, conspiracies to set prices or fix prices are uh, unlawful in violation of these antitrust laws. Instead, only market forces are allowed to control the setting of prices. So the plaintiffs alleged a um, conspiracy to fix prices as anti-competitive behavior. And um, as part of that, the, the law, of the antitrust law, the Sherman Act, um, importantly, um, provided that it was well established that it that the law said that parallel business conduct, in other words, the setting of the same prices, is circumstantial evidence of illegal agreement, but is not conclusive. There must be something more to show that there is indeed a an unlawful agreement, a conspiracy going on here to set the prices where they are. So the fact that the prices are set the same is not alone enough. It's only circumstantial evidence. Further, the law held that even conscious parallelism, in other words, knowingly setting their prices the same, can be innocent and not unlawful if it simply reflects a common reaction to market forces. So that, for instance, if you have to set your prices at X level in order to be profitable, or if it's the case that you can set your prices at Y level and people will still pay it because they want good phone and internet services, then um, that may be innocent behavior as well. That's a common reaction. If they're all setting their prices at that same level, that's innocent behavior if it is reflecting a common reaction to um, market forces. So the plaintiffs in that case um, filed their complaint alleging that there was a conspiracy, but they simply alleges, allege the fact of a conspiracy as reflected by the um, uh, similar prices, the parallel prices between the, the companies. And the defendants filed a motion to dismiss under 12b-6 for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, contending that something more factually was required in order to get past a Rule 12b-6 motion. So that was the posture in which the case came to the Supreme Court when, and the Supreme Court held that Stating a claim under Rule 8 requires a complaint with enough factual matter to suggest a right to relief um, and that allegations plausibly suggesting or not merely, con but not merely consistent with an unlawful agreement would be required. So in other words, the Supreme Court um, upheld a dismissal of the complaint on the grounds that there were not sufficient facts alleged, that if they simply, plaintiffs simply allege the fact of parallel conduct that was only circumstantial evidence. They needed more facts to prove that um, the claim was uh, was viable. Along the way, as the text points out, the court rejected the Conley no set of facts standard as taken out of context. And um, I think the excerpt, the bottom of page 448 of your text, that um, uh, 
shows what the court said in rejecting that commonly known set of facts standard is important. You should take a take a look at that. You can even pause this video now and um, return to that. Make sure you study that and understand why it is that Conley, the Conley standard was rejected, and we'll talk about that some in class. Um, in terms of the court's rationale in Twombly, there are a few things that are important to note. First, as I st stated earlier in this video, Rule 8 remains the governing standard, 8A2 in particular, and um, the court relied on that standard in supporting its um, pronouncement of this plausibility um, uh, standard, so to speak, and said that a plain statement under Rule 8 must show that the pleader is entitled to relief. Um, the court said this is not a heightened pleading standard. This is what Rule 8 requires. It requires a showing that the pleader is entitled to relief, not just a offering, perhaps, that the pleader is entitled to relief. Um, as we've said, that Conley standard was taken out of context, according to the court, and um, the court also offered, importantly, a policy rationale that antitrust litigation is very expensive. So that something more than a conclusory assertion of parallel price setting um, should have to be alleged in order to get to the point of that very expensive discovery. The idea being if the motion to, if the complaint doesn't allege enough to show entitlement to relief, then there should be no entitlement to get to require the defendant to undergo the very expensive process of discovery in a case like this. So Twombly was um, uh, taken, you know, the great note was taken of Twombly in um, the legal world after it, that decision was rendered, but a number of questions um, remained. Um, one is, had the court actually changed the pleading standard or had it, had it simply articulated it in a slightly different way? If so, if, there, if the court had changed the pleading standard, was that changed fact specific so that it really only applied to this particular case? Was it claim specific um, so that it only applied to antitrust cases? Because remember, um, we just said that one of the rationales the court offered is that discovery in antitrust cases is particularly expensive. Um, or was it context specific so that it applied not just to antitrust cases, but also to any other <clears throat> big and expensive litigation? And that might be supported also by that same rationale that the court had offered, that the expense requires that some, something more be required, perhaps, to get to discovery. So um, just a couple years later then, uh, two years later, the court granted review in Ashcroft versus Iqbal and um, answered some of those questions. So a little bit of background here. Javid Iqbal, the plaintiff, was a Pakistani Muslim, and he was arrested by the U.S. government in conjunction with its investigation into the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He, like other um, uh, others of those who were arrested and detained in conjunction with the investigation into 9-11, um, was held in what uh, is abbreviated as the Admax SHU, which was a um, high maximum security um, detention facility in um, Brooklyn, New York. And his complaint alleges that the conditions of his confinement were extraordinarily harsh. And I've excerpted here on this slide um, just one summary of some of those, uh, the allegations that he includes in his lengthy complaint concerning what those harsh conditions um, consisted of. So. As explained here, he says um, that he was deliberately and cruelly subjected to numerous instances of excessive force and verbal abuse, unlawful strip and body, body cavity searches, denial of medical treatment, denial of adequate nutrition, extended det detention and solitary confinement, denial of adequate exercise, deliberate interference with his rights to counsel and to exercise his sincere religious beliefs. Um, he contends they were placed in tiny cells for more than 23 hours a day, strip searched, monocled, and shackled when removed from their cells, and that there were no adequate standards or procedures for determining that their classification um, as, uh, was, as warranted their detention in those conditions was um, appropriate. So um, I'm including on our twin page in the course materials section a copy of the plaintiff's complaint, and I urge you to go take a look at it and read through 
um, some of the allegations that the plaintiffs made because um, I think they help you to see what it is that he was complaining about, um, which is sort of what the whole case was in the Supreme Court about to begin with. Was it, a, had he complained of enough to, um, uh, to get to discovery? So what is it that he was claiming? They obviously, it obviously sounds bad. He was um, detained in a very harsh manner. Um, and here I want to remind you that as I've said throughout our discussion of pleadings that the substantive law really matters. Well, the substantive law that he invoked was a Bivens claim. A Bivens claim takes its name from a Supreme Court case, Bivens versus um, six uh, unknown, uh, I don't have the name of it in front of me, but the Bivens case. Um, uh, which provides for an individual right of action by individuals like Mr. Iqbal against federal officers who are alleged to have violated the individual's constitutional rights. And Iqbal asserted his Bivens claims against a number of officers, um, um, beginning sort of at the base level with um, um, people who were working at the facility where he was detained, but going all the way up to the very top to FBI Director Robert Mueller and Attorney General John Ashcroft. And he contended that these two, who were the two whose motions to dismiss were the subject of the court's decision, um, in this case, the Supreme Court's decision, uh, he contended that those two high-level officers um, violated his constitutional rights, and that's what they asserted a Bivens claim against him. So importantly, as the court points out in its decision, um, there are a few aspects of a Bivens claim that um, we need to take note of. Uh, first is that a plaintiff in asserting a Bivens claim must establish that each individual defendant through his own actions has violated the Constitution. In other words, there is no respondeat superior liability uh, on, on a Bivens claim. The plaintiff has to show that the individual officer, through his own actions, violated the Constitution, not just that he might be liable for the actions of, for instance, the officers working at the Admax Shoe who were carrying out these day-to-day -day, um, uh, actions. Second, um, to show unconstitutional discrimination, the plaintiff must show that the officer acted with discriminatory purpose. In other words, took these actions because of and not merely in spite of the plaintiff's protected trait here, which was his um, religion and national origin. <clears throat> so in terms of the procedural history, the defendants Mueller and Ashcroft filed a motion to dismiss um, under Rule 12b-6, seeking dismissal of the claim, complaint for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, challenging the pleading as insufficient. The trial court denied the defendant's motions to dismiss, um, applying the Conley no set of facts standard. They said it's simply not the case that, that based on the facts alleged here, the plaintiff could prove no set of facts that would entitle him to relief. Um, the plaintiff has alleged that he was subjected to harsh conditions of confinement, um, that he was treated that way because of his uh, race, religion, and national origin, and that that should be enough to um, get him to discovery. The Court of Appeals rendered its decision after Twombly came along and <clears throat> held, uh, so the defendants had relied on Twombly and contended that it should um, uh, warrant dismissal of their case, reversal of the trial court's uh, decision. But the court rejected that argument and held that Twombly was context specific and didn't apply to Iqbal's seemingly straightforward claim of race, religion, and national origin discrimination. In other words, it adopted the view of Twombly that it applied maybe only to big expensive discovery litigation or perhaps just antitrust litigation, but didn't apply to these more straightforward types of claims of uh, discrimination like Iqbal had asserted. So that brings us to the Iqbal decision itself. And rather than walk you through that decision here, um, I want to uh, reserve our extensive discussion of it for in class, but I want to provide you with some direction um, as to what you should look for in studying the opinion and preparing to come to class and to discuss it in more detail. First, what is the Twombly two-part test? And um, you can look several places to find this. Um, one is, uh, in particular, parts 4A and 4B as well as no of, of the opinion, as well as notes 1, 2, and 3 after the case. Um, really help to lay this out for you. So notes one, two, and three really explain exactly what the parts of the test are 
and um, you can see those parts explained in sections 4a and 4b of the opinion. Um, now, as I've noted here, uh, it's a two-part test as, as described by the court and as um, described by the, or as laid out by the court and as described by the casebook authors in their notes. However, um, I want to urge that you think of it more as a three-element test or a three-part test with the first part being added to the other two that the court had already um, uh, that the court has laid out for you and that um, as I've been saying all along the substantive law matters so that you can't begin to assess the allegations in the complaint as is required under the two parts of the Twombly Iqbal test until you have first identified what the claim is so that's a big hint the first part of the test is the part that I've added and that is to identify what are the elements of the claim? And note one after the case um, tells you that explicitly, that the starting point has to be the elements of the claim. From there, then you go into the other two prongs of uh, the Twombly Iqbal test. The second thing I want you to think about then and study as you prepare for class is how did that test, the two-part test is laid out by the court, which I've expanded to three by adding the elements of the claim as the first inquiry. How did it apply in Twombly? So I've lectured here about what the claims in Twombly were about. You've got some description of them in the text. Um, look through both the summary of Twombly as well as the discussion of Twombly that is included in the Iqbal decision and see if you can work through each of the parts of that, what we'll call three-part Twickball test, uh, Twombly-Iqbal, um, and see how it applied in Twombly. Then, not surprisingly, how does it apply in Iqbal? Um, what, uh, um, what did the court decide in applying that test here? And that I can direct you more specifically to um, section 4B of the opinion, whereas 4A um, helps you to answer the second question listed here as to how it applied in Twombly. And then finally, and this is perhaps the most challenging um, part of your study, is the court's decision in Iqbal correct? And I want you to think about this from a number of standpoints. First, we've looked at the at Rule 8 itself as the foundation of um, the pleading standards that apply in federal courts. Is the court's decision in Iqbal, as a follow-on to its decision in Twombly, is it correct in light of what Rule 8 says, the plain language of Rule 8. Can you come up with arguments on both sides of that issue? In other words, can you come up with an argument that Rule 8 um, supports the court's decision? And at the same time, can you come up with an argument that the court's decision is contrary to the language of Rule 8? Second, I want you to take a look at Form 11 which is a part of the appendix of forms that follows the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure in your um, rules supplement. So look at Form 11, which is um, intended to be a reflection of a, of a complaint for a negligence claim that satisfies Rule 8. And um, think about what that says and whether the court's decision in Iqbal is correct in light of the example that is provided and expressly approved of in Form 11. Third, think about the Conley decision. Um, is the court's decision correct in light of Conley? Because um, although the court has rejected that standard as taken out of context, it hasn't explicitly overruled that case. So how, if at all, can we reconcile Conley with Iqbal? To what extent does Conley remain good law, if at all, after the Iqbal decision? And then finally, um, sort of as a matter of policy, um, is the court's decision correct? Should plaintiffs be held to the standard as described in Iqbal, or is something less um, more appropriate? What are the policy arguments on either side of that in terms of fairness and efficiency to either of the parties? So think about what all those policy implications are. And uh, part and parcel to that, take a look at the dissent. Um, is the dissent's view better? Um, why or why not? Uh, we'll be discussing all of those questions and much more in class when we get together to 
examine the Iqbal decision, and I look forward to seeing you then.